Hi guys! So today we have one of the readers from Thread Thrasher on Nightbeardia. He's going to be reading a thread that kind of links in with stuff that Nightbeardia does, so you should enjoy it. Um, check out the links below for Thread Thrasher and Spaghetti. Um, hope you enjoy the video. What makes Eldridge Abominations like the old one so incomprehensible? We can wrap our heads around paradoxes, quantum mechanics, theoretical physics, and way more. The moment we stare or sometimes even think about these creatures, we go batshit crazy or die. What's so mind-shattering about a big ugly squid? Big ugly squid. I wish I was still that innocent. Still unaware of what they really are. Once you know, once you really understand, or if you are among those damned to witness it yourself, once you know, you will never forget. It keeps me up at night, and if not for my physician's pity, I would never sleep at all. Squids. It's charming, frankly. The old gods, with bloated and frowning faces, writhing with tentacles like the beard of Neptune, like a god of Egypt with a man's body and animal's head, a curiosity and little more. The truth? Well, I cannot tell you the truth, not properly, as a man of science should. These things are beyond our science. Still, I understand things about them that explain some of the reports, and perhaps you can carry on my research now that I can no longer pursue it. It comes down to dimensions. We possess three, height, width, and depth. Grip a billiard ball, fill your fingers, wrap around it, and you will understand. Now imagine a creature that existed in only two of those three dimensions, in a universe that described a simple plane through our own. To that creature, the billiard ball would appear to be a simple circle, growing and shrinking as it passes through the planes of the creature's universe. Imagine how our hand would look. Strange fleshy circles filled with pulsing fluids. Shards of bone, glistening meat. The creature could never understand what it was really seeing, as it could no more conceive of a hand than it could imagine a creature like us, moving freely in three dimensions and gripping billiard balls on a whim. The abominations, as you aptly describe them, are to us as we are to that benighted creature. They exist in dimensions beyond our own, whose nature we can hardly guess. When they appear to us, we see only fragments of their bodies, long stretches of writhing flesh glistening with juices that should not exist outside of a body, which whip through the air and vanish back where they came from in a way that our minds simply refuse to accept. Witnesses have tried to describe these as great tentacles, or it's failing them in the presence of such incomprehensibility. Those who heard the stories seized on this and explained them as resembling cephalopods. This is a comforting lie as there is nothing in the most Stygian depths of the darkest sea that is not our beloved brother compared to the horrors of the abominations. This is a creature who is incomprehensibly alien, and our only glimpse is a sickening flash of writhing, elongated flesh that slips into our world and back out. Worse than the appearance of the creature, though, is its disappearance. Your mind knows, on some level, that this creature, this hateful, hungry god of a creature, is not moving its body between here and away, but between being a glimpse of writhing horror and a horror that watches unseen. Imagine our two-dimensional creature again, and imagine yourself to be a cruel child. If you chose to torment the creature, it would be powerless to resist. It cannot perceive you unless you chose to intersect its plane. You can watch its every move, and it cannot hope to escape your gaze. It would be the simplest thing in the world to push a pin through it, like a butterfly on a card. Take a glass of water and push it into the creature's plane, and it will find itself trapped, drowning in an inescapable sea. The creature is entirely at your mercy, and always will be. Same as you, same as me. Oh damn, I'm scared now. I seem to remember it being worse than that. It's not just a matter of phasing into and out of our reality, but about the geometry being all wrong. A flatlander might see strange things appearing and disappearing, and changing shape, but all still within, or without, that two-dimensional plane. Imagine, instead, that you were wrong, and it's not a plane. It's not just warped, bent neatly in geometric patterns, as Einstein's relativity would suggest. Instead, it's crumpled and lumpy. We impose our ideas of straight lines and rectangular dimension, as though the universe were ordered and rational. At bottom, it's not. Perhaps not just geometry is wrong, 
but perhaps math or even pure logic is simply wrong. Ideas as basic as that, a proposition, properly specified, must be either true or false, and cannot be both at the same time in the same way. All that might be our conceited attempt to make sense where there is none. To me, the scary thought isn't that you go mad when you see an old god, rather that we're the ones who are mad, maintaining a comfortable delusion so that we can function, while all the while it's the raving lunatics who are right, that we pretend to be sane, while reality is itself insane, disordered, random, yet malicious, and an old god is just the sort of thing to remind you of that. It is a thing that should not be. It cannot do anything but simply exist, and its existence would be an affront to every scrap of sanity you cling to. I really liked your post, Sanity and Anarchy. A societally sane person is confident in the parameters of the system we exist in. Unfortunately, the mechanics of the system are undefined. It certainly is an awkward position to be in. One example I can think of is this. Anybody who brings up some crazy secret society like the Illuminati and vehemently insists on its existence and prescience is called a kook. However, if it was then revealed that in fact such a society exists, has existed for hundreds of years, and everything that kook said was true, our opinion of him would instantly and permanently flip from he's insane to he's sane. And he didn't change at all. The only thing that changed was us. Not necessarily. A person can be correct and still mentally unstable. Take the conspiracy nuts, like me, who kept telling people the various governmental initialisms were spying on everyone, often illegally, by means of complicated backdoors installed under threat and sweetheart deals with ISPs and electronics manufacturers. They turned out to be absolutely correct. It doesn't make them, me, any less nuts, just correct on that subject. Many of them were considered nuts on the basis of the above claim alone, but many were considered nuts because they were nuts and that particular claim was just one facet of their delusion. Tesla was one of the greatest and most revolutionary scientific minds of all time. He still died bankrupt and alone, pining over supernatural delusions about pigeons. If anyone's interested, there's a good visualization of this effect, a four-dimensional rotation of a three-dimensional horse. Even this is an approximation though. Because the horse itself can still be defined using only 3D coordinates. This is, however, a good approximation of what a fourth dimensional old one could do to you or your surroundings if it chose to fuck up your shit. It would be much like taking one of those aforementioned circle people and rotating them perpendicular to the plane of existence. It's hard to say what would happen to the horse, or the cameraman for that matter, seeing that he's now inside the horse from a certain light. It's possible three-dimensional life simply could not function in such a condition. You start to see what Lovecraft meant when he said we live on such a placid film of reality. According to Lovecraft, the fact this doesn't happen to you on a daily basis is just a testament to how insignificant we are to these creatures. If they ever started to interact with you, benign or not, you'd quickly come to realize how inhospitable the universe is by the very virtue of its mathematical nature. Technically speaking, a creature living in two dimensions would only perceive one-dimensional lines, not two-dimensional cross-sections. This is true, yet in the same way we only see a two-dimensional plane when we look with our eyes. Only optical and mental tricks like depth perception and memory give us a sense that what we're looking at is three-dimensional. We can feel our being in three dimensions, but we can't ever see all three simultaneously. Also. A creature outside of our three dimensions would be able to see our insides as well as our outsides, all at once, while looking down into our space. Similar to how if we look at a circle on a plane, we can see both its area and perimeter simultaneously, all from the same perspective. Flatland describes all this more eloquently than I could, and I definitely recommend it to everyone here. It's not a trick. It's called sensor synthesis and gives more information than the individual sensors summed. This is a well-studied branch of engineering commonly in use in modern industrial and military environments. Additionally, it is not impossible for an X-dimensional being to perceive an X-dimension, nor is it impossible for such beings to sense inside of objects, and we can give real-world examples of such. Dolphins and dogs come to mind. And it's not inconceivable that a life form could develop an MRI type sense. I, for one, welcome our ancient eldritch overlords. Then repeat after me. Glee, glen, eh.
Cthulhu with the eh, fucking mm. Sounds about how I pictured them, and I never read a single Lovecraftian tale. Though, I will counter with this. Not unlike how a bacteria or virus can slay creatures far, far greater than it, it would be equally foolish to presume that just because it resides on a similar plane of difference, that we cannot or may not be, if not today, then one day be fully capable of slaying such entities that poke themselves into our particular frame of reference. I assume it would take a lot more, of course. If I had five or ten dimensions to my being, I'd rotate a few on instinct in event of injury, like how we may flinch from a paper cut. Repeated paper cuts, however, would make you think a bit before touching it again, and I would at least credit the multidimensional beings depicted with that much reasoning capability. Failing that, well, we have a lot of leftover nukes lying around, and kinetic kill weapons around the corner, and direct energy weapons right now. I suppose we could see how many paper cuts it could take to kill it. We can wrap our heads around paradoxes, but that doesn't mean we understand them or how they can exist. Eldridge abominations basically force us to understand how they can exist. We can't protect our minds with, well, it's only a theory or it makes no sense, it just works, as far as they're concerned. They exist in more dimensions than we do. Their shapes cannot work in the real world, and you know that it's not a perception trick. Think of the uncanny valley if you've ever hit that. Now multiply that a thousandfold and you're scratching the surface. To add on to this, human brains are programmed to think about the world in specific ways. We perceive time as linear, judge the universe based off of a very narrow spectrum of light, and have great difficulty imagining relativistic speeds. This is to say nothing of the universal laws we may have yet to discover. This is child's play to say Cthulhu. The mere presence of Cthulhu subtly buries thoughts of strange realities into your subconscious. Realities that we may or may not comprehend, but could never, ever experience. So, what do you guys think makes Eldridge Abominations so incomprehensible? Why don't you let us know in the comments below? And if you like this video, why don't you leave a like? If you haven't subscribed already, why don't you go and do that too? And if you'd like more videos like this one, I tried Thread Thrasher. It's our sort of our hub for uh, more videos in this style. Uh, you can check that out in the link in the description below. Uh, and yeah, if you like my voice, why don't you check out my channel as well. It's called Spaghetti, also in the link in the description below. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and also I hope you have a good day. Peace.